we've got a great set of folks here today. And I am at this point in time going to turn it over to Jillian for uh, managing the agenda. We do encourage you guys to, um, and there will be points in time that we ask you um, to use the chat um, to respond um, or with the number with the 52 people that we have online. Um, if you do have a question, uh, um, please use the raise hand function and that'll make sure that it gets you moved to the front of the, the queue for any questions that you have. I'm not going to tell you where the restrooms are because I don't know where your restrooms are, but I'm certain that after 18 months you all have found them. Um, so Jillian, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you, Maida. Um, we do have a full agenda today and, um, and I don't wanna to get too sappy here, but I do want to um, in this forum with this many people here to thank you for your leadership, for your vision with this partnership. Um, you've really helped us to build a strong foundation that now um, this partnership has its own momentum moving forward. So we will do our best um, to, to carry it along um, and really do wish you well in your next um, in your next adventure with the Forest Service. So uh, now that that's out of the way, um, the agenda today is um, is really full. We're excited for all the information that we have to share with you all. So um, a quick run through of the agenda. Um, John Unger is gonna speak first and give an update on the Business Oregon grant and loan funding. Um, I will then give an update and uh, solicit some feedback from you all on the um, fall or perhaps winter outreach that we are planning. Um, we will have a regulatory update um, from Irma and Greg, and then uh, presentations on the decision support tool and the pipe sizing tool by those teams. Um, and then we will wrap up at five o'clock. Um, just as a reminder for those of you who weren't on when I said it before that this meeting is being recorded and will be posted up on the Tagate Partnership website. So when that link is up, I will send it out to everyone. Um, there are, are a number of folks who aren't able to join us today. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to John Unger with Business Oregon to provide an update on the grant and loan program. Perfect, thank you, Jillian, and, and thank you, Meta, for it's been a pleasure to work with you. Uh, and it's inspiring to see this large of a group of folks Anytime it takes 17 minutes to go through introductions, uh, that's that uh, says something really good about uh, the breadth of, of knowledge and, and that you guys have been able to gather. And so uh, really well done there. You know, I'm not going to be able to stick around for this whole meeting, but I'll provide an update on the uh, Tidegate program and then uh, be happy to take any questions. Uh, kind of the situation is, is uh, as you may know, we went through a process where we uh, had a proposal uh, to the legislature that proposal was accepted. We had funds, then we had less funds because of COVID. We opened up a planning project solicitation and a construction project solicitation. The planning project solicitation uh, resulted in quite a few applications. Um, the construction project, not as, not as many. We had one construction project that took advantage of the expedited process for smaller construction projects that are ready to go. We wanted to give those shovel ready construction projects money quick. And so we had one entity that took advantage of that. And where it stands now, uh, we are targeting uh, you know, $2.5 million to planning and construction projects. Uh, we've awarded $1.8 million of that already. We have another large construction project for half a million dollars that's you know, nearing uh, the finish line. And we do have some need to gather up some landowner agreement documents for some of these projects before we can start releasing funds. We were able to get, you know, the, the, technically the money was to expire June 30th of 2021. We did achieve an extension for another two years. And so uh, we have until June 30th of 2023 to spend the money now for all these projects that we've selected. We had one planning project drop off in another, and uh, we've decided to allocate those funds to the tight gate sizing tool. Um, and that, that we're looking into that as an option. We don't have the capacity to do another, you know, if we had some small amount of money available, we don't have the capacity to really do a full blown solicitation and we couldn't even fund one planning project. And so as it stands now, um, we don't have any more solicitation cycles on the books. We had, a, or that are planned at this time. We had a wonderful Tidegate uh, project manager, Shelby Gonzalez, and she was so good 
that she decided to accept another position in her in the agency. And so I've been uh, uh, myself and Alina Putinsev have been uh, tackling kind of some Tigate stuff with Alina mostly doing the, most of the work. I've been working on a couple of uh, staff recommendations for these construction projects. And uh, the, the future of the program, you know, it's, it's set to sunset in 2023. And so as it stands today, um, you know, unfortunately, it's, it's set to sunset. And so unless something changes, uh, that's, that's the kind of outlook. Now, that's uh, real unfortunate because with all these really, and we're, we're targeting, you know, maybe 14 planning projects, I think, uh, each of which are getting, you know, 100000 a pop. That is a lot of money to spend on projects that are going to be ready to move forward. And then to not have a funding source to move those forward, you know, that's a real shame. And so, um, you know, that's, that's a real challenge and it's not, not ideal. And it's, um, you know, kind of out of our hands as an agency. Uh, but, you know, hopefully the, the, there becomes a, a means of seeing those projects through to, to realization. I think that's the, that's the high level takeaway. We're looking to hire another project manager. And so it may be kind of a dual role position, but we will uh, hire a limited duration position in the future to manage the day to day of these grants that are heading out the door. And so we have two years to spend the money. Uh, there's going to be, you know, we, the, there'll be invoices to review, there'll be uh, work to do. And so we are going to be, we are planning to hire somebody to do that work. And so there'll be a new face in the program uh, as we undertake these wonderful projects and, and see them see move forward. So it's been a, it's a pretty dang uh, in-depth process we went through uh, to see it all go away. You know, that it didn't feel, you know, it, it's the rulemaking was, was pretty detailed. The proposal legislature, the landowner agreements, you know, we have a lot of work that's been done to stand this program up. And so, uh, you know, it's got good bones, like a house, you know, that, that um, you know, so, so that's, that's kind of the, uh, the takeaway is that as it stands today, we're, we're you know, going to be winding down in two years, but, but there'll be all these wonderful projects. And so it's a little bit of a, you know, challenge there. But I don't, did I admit anything else, Jillian, that, that I should have covered or touched on? I think you covered it and we've got a little bit of time. So if folks, uh, we could take a couple of questions or if folks want to put questions in the chat. Any questions for John? Okay, not seeing any. Um, I do have a bit of a funding update as well. Um, in addition to the Business Oregon funds, um, OWEB, in July at uh, the last board meeting, OWEB's board did approve additional governor's priority funding for this Tiger initiative. And so um, those funds, th those are the same funds that went um, toward funding the decision support tool and the pipe sizing tool, um, the inventory, some of, all of that of other work that's been done. And so these additional funds um, will go toward development of a monitoring protocol for Tigate projects. Um, and will also go toward further refinement of the engineering pipe sizing tool that you'll all hear more about um, later today. So if there are no other questions, um, let's see. There's one question I saw. Uh, so all planning for uh, all funding for planning has been committed. Yes, uh, we had one planning solicitation cycle, one construction solicitation uh, cycle. The combination of those two cycles resulted in virtually the exact amount of money that we uh, had available. And so uh, we had complex and uh, criteria that, that ODF and W and OEB would have had to help with to kind of figure out and rank these things that we didn't have to use that. So that was a real time saving and it ended up being exactly the amount of projects this funding we had, but not really much, if any, left over. And so uh, likely as it stands today, we won't be we don't have any plans to solicit, uh, solicit an application cycle for more planning projects. And then I see one more question in the chat that came in from Sarah. Is there going to be any effort to advocate for additional funding for the Business Oregon program? You know, that, that wouldn't be a question for me. <laughs> I think uh, agencies aren't able to advocate for their own programs. And so, uh, you know, that's, I, I couldn't speak to that. Um, certainly as, as good stewards of state funds, uh, we do acknowledge that having all these planning projects that are shovel ready with time sensitive permits 
and then not having a venue to fund them is a, is a not a positive um, outcome. Yeah, and I, I would suggest um, for the, uh, you know, there's the agency budget that can get built, but for the non, <coughs> excuse me, agency partners, something you might want to think about for the 2023 session about what you want to push. <coughs> excuse me. Okay. Jillian, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Greg Apke, Oregon Fish and Wildlife. John, thanks for the update. If I heard you right, or maybe I didn't hear um, much of an update on the construction uh, implementation side of the house, did your overall summary speak to that part of the funding budget as well, or was that more just a technical assistance solicitation? No, that's that's all in. Uh, you know, we don't we have um, you know one point eight million of total awards. One of those is a five hundred thousand dollar grant uh, for construction. Uh, we may be. Just because we've awarded doesn't mean we've closed the contract and, and it, all the parties have signed. There's also pieces related to land loan agreements that are somewhat le legal aspects that, that probably take some time to flush out. And so uh, we received four construction applications and I don't know that any of them have broken ground yet, um, but we're working with them to uh, move forward as quickly as possible. Okay. Thank you, John. Okay, thank you, John. So the next item is uh, on the agenda is the fall outreach update. Um, so I think you'll all likely, I hope you'll all agree at the end of this meeting that there's a lot of work that's been done in the last year and a half and it's really time to share that out with folks so they know um, what we've been up to. So I wanted to use this meeting as an opportunity to get some feedback from you all on what we were thinking about um, for, for an outreach meeting. Um, so we're gonna ask you guys to use the chat feature here. Um, and what we are proposing um, is to host three outreach sessions, um, a North, a Mid and a South Coast session. Um, we had really hoped that we'd be at a place where we could do um, an in-person, you know, host them in person um, out on the coast. But given the state of things right now, um, they will remain virtual. Um, we do hope to, we, we intend to cover um, really the big, the big buckets um, of topics that we've been talking about for the last couple of years. So to, to provide an update and information on the inventory, on the decision support tool, the pipe sizing tool, um, the work around regulatory coordination and, um, and around funding. So basically everything that you are going to hear about today are things that we wanna bring out um, on the virtual road anyway. Um, so that we're, we're, we're looking for some feedback here um, is in addition to those um, topics or more detail about those topics, I guess, if you would use the chat or if you can email me later if you're on the phone, um, if there are additional topics or specific elements of those um, topics that you would like to see in those outreach sessions, really what do you think is meaningful for us to get out um, into the communities? If you remember, we did these outreach sessions um, four or five or six different locations along the coast to, to listen to um, to anyone who wanted to come and talk to us about tie gates. There are a lot of landowners there, local organizations there. And this is um, our what we're hoping is our opportunity to share back out with them um, that we heard them and what we did with that information and, and how we plan to move forward. So if there are specific things you think we need to include in that outreach messaging. And then the other piece um, is if, you would be interested, while we'll, we plan to do that outreach sessions um, in this kind of virtual format, if there is interest in some type of um, in-person, outside, physically distanced um, site visit um, out on the coast and um, to see a Tidegate project, um, if that is something that interests you, then what is it specifically you might like to see or to learn about there? So if folks um, want to consider that and throughout the, the meeting today, uh, provide that feedback in the chat. So again, just specific information that you think we should get out during these outreach sessions, if there's anything. Um, and 
if you would be interested in an outdoor um, gathering, a site visit, and what and what that should focus on. So I'm going to give you guys just a couple minutes to think about that and put some info in the chat for us. It looks like Maida is writing out the questions in there. Thank you, Maida. Okay, so since my dogs are now barking, I'm going to let you guys, I'm going to mute myself and hand it over to Irma and Greg, who are going to give a regulatory update. And um, folks, just use that chat as your ideas come to you throughout the rest of the day. <laughs> Don't leave us, corner. Um, Greg and I agreed that um, he's going to start. Um, the update. Thank you, Greg. I don't remember that agreement, but I'm happy. <laughs> it's the all... great state of Oregon going first. Yeah, thank you. Um, I feel a little speed bumped here since I wasn't going to participate today until just recently. I had them in a conflict with the Fish Passes Rules meeting. So thanks, Irma. Um, well, I am happy uh, to be here, and I too want to thank uh, Meta for all of her uh, skills and leadership. We're going to miss you, Irma, or Meta, sorry. Um, on the regulatory front, I do think we have a lot to speak about, and I don't know how much time, Jillian, we have for any Q&A, but that might be some time well spent here as well. And I presume that the regulatory community would have a role in the fall outreach. Um, I would hope that to be the case where we can really uh, mingle with with landowners, answer questions, and start to provide additional technical assistance and guidance on how to get through the regulatory agencies, which we know is still a challenge. We have spent a lot of time, as folks know, um, we've met many, many times over the last uh, couple of years, and we have uh, come out of the process with what we think is going to be a much more efficient, a streamlined effort. Um, I guess before we get into the weeds and let Irma kind of get into those details, we do and have recognized that while the different agencies, particularly the Corps of Engineers, the Division of State Lands, NOAA Fisheries and ODFW, we all recognize up front that we do have um, our own authorities defined under both state and federal law. And that's challenging to put all that into one pretty little box so it fits everyone's needs. And we've done, I think, our very best to accomplish those goals. Um, I'll call a, a brief bit of attention to the Tygate website. Um, we have rolled out kind of a, a stepwise procedure specific for landowners. One of the things we heard when we did the outreach was, what are the expectations on the landowners? Who do we call? What are the steps in the process? Because it's very, very confusing and we recognize that. So. On the Tidegate website, you'll notice uh, that there is now posted kind of a stepwise procedure for landowners to follow. And within those different stepwise boxes, you're going to see what it is that is expected on the landowner, as well as what is expected on the regulatory front. We don't necessarily have timelines associated with that. And there's some reasons behind that. But we hope that that product is in fact gonna be a helpful tool for folks knowing what the process looks like, who is engaged and where do you all as landowners intersect with the different uh, authorities on fish passage and tight gates. And I'm not sure what the final number was, um, Jillian, on numbers of agencies that we all looked at and stepped back, but it's, um, there's a lot of agencies, there's about 10. I, I see nine fingers, Jillian. So that said, I'm gonna turn it back for a few moments to Irma and Irma, you can uh, continue and then I can close. Okay, okay, that sounds good, Greg, thank you. Um, You're welcome. Well, a, a couple of things from the interagency team. One, uh, I just wanna begin by thanking NRCS for the funding they provided to support 
uh, our, our Tidegate coordinator, Jillian McCarthy, I mean, this is just a, a huge advantage, uh, I think, to all of us. Um, so, so just great <laughs> gratitude to NRCS and, and OWEB hosting that position. Um, we're just super excited to be working with Jillian and helping us really improve our agency efforts and our coordination and also assisting and supporting uh, landowners and watershed councils as, as the need arises. So that's, I think, a great step forward. Um, that comes directly from the Oregon Tidegate Partnership and I think the, the vision there. So that's, that's good progress. Um, to date, we uh, have not had a Tidegate replacement go through the entire process map. And we are, uh, you know, eager <laughs> to exercise and practice in this new, better aligned um, collaborative process where we're working among the agencies more as one team. Um, and we just have not had that opportunity. Part of it certainly is COVID. Part of it is um, Business Oregon getting their their uh, program off the ground, off and running. Um, I know there is a lot of projects in the in the hopper, so to speak. So we do expect within the next six, eight months to a year that we will we'll have gone through these these eight steps with at least a couple of tight gate replacements. So we're looking forward to that. Um, we are continuing to position ourselves to be ready um, to, to work through this new process. Um, one of the things we're doing is the interagency team is meeting monthly. We have a standing meeting um, just to coordinate on uh, what's going on on the ground and try to problem solve and really just get organized uh, for, for what we think will be a lot of tide gate replacements, certainly over the next five years. Um, the other thing that's happening is that the leaders of the four, I'll just say main agencies, Jillian's correct, there's actually nine permitting entities for tide gate replacements. And I heard Maida say this, this type of infrastructure project is one of the most highly regulated projects in the state of Oregon. So here we are. Uh, but for that reason, among others, uh, our leadership um, among DSL, ODFNW, um, the Army Corps and the NOAA Fisheries, they're meeting and committed to meet on a quarterly basis um, to make sure that they're aware of the challenges that we're facing and really just support this joint ownership of this new eight step process. The last thing I'll mention is that the interagency team did join the last estuaries and Tidegate affinity group and if you don't know what that group is, it's uh, it's part of the Oregon Conservation Partnership. Um, they've broken out into a couple of different affinity groups and we were happy to join them. They sent us questions in advance and I think we had some pretty good, pretty good dialogue uh, with that affinity group and, and the interagency team. Um, yeah, yeah, really I think to, really enhance our communication even more with this very um, kind of daunting and complicated process, um, considering there's nine entities involved in permitting it. Um, so that's what I have. Uh, I also, um, if I don't have another chance to, to say anything today, I also want to uh, acknowledge, Maida, your just in inspirational leadership uh, on really <laughs> convening uh, uh, the partnership and and also convening and facilitating the interagency team and and coming up with a better process. So just thank you. It's just great, greatly uh, appreciate your efforts. Thank you and best of luck. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Irma and Greg. One other thing, Irma, I don't think I heard either of you mention um, the the idea that you've all been discussing of piloting. Um, 
standing design meetings for projects. And it's still in very early phases, but I will just mention because I think it's something that um, really shows how invested the agencies are in improving communication and coordination with our uh, project partners. So they are um, proposing piloting a, a regular standing meeting for project partners to be able to meet with all agencies at the same time, um, or as many agencies, I guess, maybe it won't be all nine, um, we're still working through the details, there, but at least these four core agencies um, to be able to discuss the project and get feedback and have everyone here um, and, and be able to discuss the project at the same time, which I, I hope will go a long way to meeting everyone's needs. Um, so it's one other thing that, that this group is working to, um, to listen and to, and to problem solve and try to find some solutions. So. Jillian, can I close? Just Absolutely. To, uh, I appreciate that. Um, I guess I just, having been now through this process, it seems like it's been forever ago when we started the, the listening sessions up and down the coast with Meta's leadership. Um, we've come a long way, and I think now it is time to try out the new process. I really encourage folks to participate. Um, I encourage folks that maybe or maybe have a history of being uh, overwhelmed with the complex regulatory process and I'll be the first to admit uh, while we have made this, I think, much more efficient and streamlined. And as Irma Longo-Marcino mentioned, we have agency commitment and buy-in to this from top to bottom. It's time to get this on the ground and get it implemented. And for project owners that um, are timid, I would really encourage participation. Get out in front of this. Uh, start making the calls, work closely with Jillian, the tight gate coordinator, because she has, has, she has a pivotal role in just that, coordinating your project amongst the regulatory agencies and helping to advocate for you as a landowner and advocate as, I guess, a shepherd of the process. So uh, time is upon us to get this active and implemented. Um, I won't say the process is perfect. I won't oversell that, um, but I do think it's going to be much of an improved process with commitment across the regulatory agencies. So yeah, please don't let the process preclude you from stepping up and, and recognizing your project and participating. And with that, uh, we look forward to yeah, your projects. Thank you. Thank you, Greg and Irma. Um, so we are gonna keep Moving along in the agenda, um, I'm going to hand it over to Jason Knuckles and Gina Carter with the Nature Conservancy um, to give you a uh, presentation on the decision support tool. So, Jason, are you going to take it away? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to okay. share my screen here in a second. And I have a short presentation to kind of kick off the, the discussion. And then Gina's going to join me in a little question and answer and uh, look forward to it. All right, is everybody seeing my screen? Thumbs up, cool. Yes. I'll do one more thing here, excuse me. All righty, well, thanks for the opportunity to speak with everyone today. I am Jason Knuckles with the Nature Conservancy, and I'm excited to discuss the Tidegate optimization tool and the progress we've made under the OWIP grant that's been funding this work. As a reminder, uh, since its inception, one of the key interests of the Oregon Tidegate Partnership is developing tools to inform Tidegate replacement and removal decisions. So we're here today to talk about this Tidegate optimization tool. Sorry about that. Uh, we're excited about the tool because like uh, many of you, the Nature Conservancy is interested in the solutions that allow for productive use of the coastal lands while producing, while providing access to habitats needed for wildlife to thrive. Our goal was to develop a tool to assist user groups, including private landowners, watershed councils, funding agencies, resource planners, by providing information useful for launching conversations and for developing and implementing tide gate replacement strategies. We began the work in 2016 um, by looking at the universe of models and software packages that were out there. And eventually we settled on a widely used fish passage optimization model. 
there are many others using this optimization approach to evaluate fish passage. Uh, to the south of us, the California Fish Passage Forum uses the same optimization tool. Uh, formerly in the Tillamook area, the Salmon Superhighway was using this tool. And there are projects all across the United States from the Great Lakes to the Gulf of Maine using the tool. And I was pretty excited that the largest fish passage project in the world happening right now called AMBER that's looking at all of Europe's fish passage barriers is also using the same tool we are. So it's tri kind of tried and true. This model is excellent at looking at streams and linear networks, but we needed it to consider the horizontal flow of water across the estuaries and the tidal floodplain. So we adapted the model to consider the tidal effects of the landscape in addition to that stream network above the tides. This new approach is probably the first of its kind around the world. And we conduct, conducted initial pilot projects to test the tool in the Coquille and the Coost estuaries. And after we felt confident about its utility, we sought to expand and further develop the tool. We were particularly interested in adding functionality beyond fish habitat and providing information that's applicable to a larger set of stakeholders in support of tide gate decision making. To do this expansion work, we received a grant from OWEB in 2020. And the first thing we wanted to do was listen to a variety of stakeholders and understand their needs in the tide gate decision making. So stakeholder outreach was conducted in two phases. In the first phase, phase OWEB facilitated one-on-one -on -one and group discussions with relevant agencies and organizations involved in this decision making. That included funders, restoration practi practitioners, um, agricultural community, permitters, compliance agencies, and such. And these conversations sought to gather feedback and guidance on the features that could be added to the tool. Next stakeholder outreach survey, a stakeholder outreach survey was distributed in February of 2020 um, to about 248 people, included everyone here in the Tidegate Partnership Communications List, uh, numerous NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service employees throughout Oregon, uh, members of all three West Coast Fish Habitat Partnerships and many other Tidegate stakeholders as were recommended by the survey respondents. Of all those respondents, 90% um, of them said that they work with Tidegates, 77% said that Tidegate optimization tool would be helpful to them, and 82% said they'd be interested in learning how to use the tool. When the survey closed, we analyzed the responses for content. We conducted and uh, follow-up discussions with staff from NRCS, Department of Agriculture, Department of Fish and Wildlife, Tillamook County, list goes on and on, Oregon Farm Bureau, Oregon Department of Land Conservation Development, Terrain Works, Wild Salmon Center, Institute for Applied Ecology. Um, I'm probably missing some, but we wanted to better understand the details of all of those responses that we got back. Overall, respondents expressed a strong interest in how tide gates protect infrastructure. This included the protection of private infrastructure, such as agricultural land, farm structures, and houses, as well as public infrastructure, um, such as roads and municipal buildings. Uh, other interests that emerged from the feedback included the role of tide gates in flood risk reduction, uh, tide gates effects on fish and wildlife, water and habitat quality, and the future of climate change and sea level rise impacts. So following the stakeholder outreach process, the next step was to identify and evaluate available spatial data sets capable of representing each one of our interests. So in examining the data sets, we conducted a systematic and rigorous process that involved research, vetting, outreach to partners, many, many, many interviews and consultations with experts in each one of these topic areas. The data sets, the data sets selected for the tool were chosen based on public availability, coverage, scale, and quality. And in every instance, an effort was made to select data sets that align with those already used by partner agencies and stakeholder groups when appropriate. A detailed description of this investigation and those data sets that were considered and those data sets that were chosen can all be found in the report that we just submitted to OWEB. So this tool is designed to allow practitioners and decision makers to examine the following question. What is the set of tide gates and culverts in a watershed or watersheds that, if removed or replaced, could act, maximize net gains for limited financial budget? So the gains that can be examined are included here on the slide, and they come directly from that feedback we talked about that we see, received from stakeholders. 
I will point out here that when it comes to habitat quality, we've been working closely with ODFW and Greg's staff with the intent to use their habitat quality metric in the near future. Oh, skip point. For those of you that want to geek out just a little bit on the technical aspects of the tool, <laughs> or you can turn the sound and mic off right now if you want to. But uh, so here's a simple conceptual diagram of how the tool works, including each component of the tool and how they interact. So this walks you from the left to the right through each step in the process. But it's important to point out and note that this tool does not produce one static answer or a perfect answer. It's dynamic. It's meant to be run iteratively. And it's meant to be run for scenarios that or mean something to each user. For example, you can choose the region that you want to run. You can choose a watershed, multiple watersheds, eventually be able to choose the entire coast. You can choose the gains or the targets that you're interested in, such as infrastructure, such as ag land, such as fish habitat. And you can select the climate scenario that you want to look at from the present all the way forward, looking out to 2100 in the future. You can also use different budget levels, which can be useful for estimating return on investment or for fundraising and budgeting conversations. So again, more details about each one of these steps and how the model runs, very details laid out in the report. Didn't want to bore everyone too much today. Here's an example of the results that are generated by the tool. In this example, this person is running the tool that looked at potential habitat gain for coho salmon in a watershed. In this scenario, it shows that substantial gains in accessible fish habitat can occur at a budget levels up to approximately $7 million. After about $7 million, there are diminishing returns on higher investment levels. So in addition to a return on investment curve like this, the tool is gonna to generate a report indicating the specific barriers that if removed or replaced, achieve this maximum gain for that $7 million result. This can be particularly useful if a user wants to answer such questions as, how much should I invest in a watershed if I wanna see significant coho gains? Or which specific landowner should I approach to see if we're interested in discussing a partnership with them? Or um, is the tie gate that I'm working on a high priority one for this, this answer? So we're gonna drill down a little bit deeper. And this is, we're looking at a simplified example that will help us show how the tool allows users flexibility in choosing their target or their targets of interest. And it demonstrates how your choices determine the optimal set of barriers to replace to achieve the largest gains for those targets. So in the top of the image here, there are five tide gates illustrated by the yellow dots there. Each of the gates is associated with different amounts of benefit targets. Two of the gates also have culverts upstream of them indicated by the yellow triangles there. The estimated cost to replace the tide gates and the culverts ranges from $75,000 to $800,000, this line here on costs. And in this example we're using here, the proposed budget level is a million dollars. That's, that's an important determinant for the number of tide gates identified each solution. So changes to that proposed budget would result in a different combination of tide gates included in each solution. So I'm gonna walk down each one of these scenarios. Starting at the bottom there in scenario one, the desired outcome there is to replace the barriers that lead to the largest gain in coho habitat. And since coho use both the stream habitat and the off-channel areas that are tidally inundated, the optimization model is run for both of these targets. And in this case, the tide gate number five there is identified as the optimal candidate for replacement because it has a relatively large inundation area, the most potential gain in stream habitat, um, even though it's the most expensive barrier. So suppose the desired outcome um, is to only maximize off-channel tidal inundation area, such as in scenario two right there. In this case, tide gates three and four um, are identified for replacements since they have the largest inundation area and the length of stream habitats no longer a consideration. So the model chooses tide gate three over tide gate five because it's slightly larger area and significantly lower replacement cost. Keep on moving down. So um, the optimal set of barriers also differs if a model considers the gain in agricultural land and buildings, scenario three, rather than focusing only on protecting agricultural land in scenario four right there. So in scenario three, the large number of buildings 
present behind a tide gate, uh, tide gates one and two, this uh, 25 and 10 right here, uh, influence the solution. But in scenario four, the large amount of agricultural land present behind tide gate three and four drives the solution. So in scenario five, keep moving down to the last one, the desired outcome is to replace barriers that are protecting the most roads and bridges. Tide gates one and two are identified for replacement in this scenario since they're associated with the largest road segment and both a bridge and a smaller road, um, both a bridge and a smaller road respectively. Um, even though tie gate five has two bridges right here, it's estimated replacement call cost prevents it from being included in this solution. So I know this is a lot to take in. I'm throwing like a million scenarios at you at once, but the main point in this simplified illustration, and I hope is to give you a sense of the flexibility of the tool to answer different questions for different user groups. So we're working right now to run the optimization tool in all of the major estuaries, and we anticipate completing this by the end of 2022. An important objective of this project was to disseminate this tool equitably to all the stakeholders that are interested in its application and its results. Over the course of the project, we've presented the tool and described its basic functions to a lot of groups, a lot of gatherings, and we're willing to do a lot more outreach and, and um, presentations. So please let us know if you have any upcoming opportunities with your user groups or anybody that you know of who are willing to share information, we'd love to reach out more. Um, we're also creating a user manual right now to teach folks how to run the tool and interpret the results. And we're planning on training, um, we plan on providing training to stakeholders that want to learn how to use the tool. Due to pandemic and associated restrictions of travel and such, uh, this should be a clause in every presentation now, right? Due to the pandemic, <laughs> um, in-person trainings haven't been held to date, but we'll continue to reevaluate. And um, if possible, we'll hold things in, in person. If not possible, then we're gonna end up to probably doing webinar trainings here in the near future. Um, and lastly, I would say, we still anticipate there's gonna be future additions and, enhance and enhancements as people identify further needs or if data becomes available. Uh, one example of that would be a Pacific lamprey. We have all the coho, I mean, we have all the salmonid species in the, the tool right now, but lamprey is one that data is still lacking for. Of course, we want to spend, expend, extend special thanks um, and appreciation to all the members of the Oregon Tide Partnership and all the other staff from so many agencies and organizations that were uh, gave us their time. They provided so much appreciated feedback and input into this project. And we also recognize our funders, Wild Rivers Coast Alliance, and especially Oregon Watershed Enhancement Boards and many private donors that have been funding this work as well. So that's what I have. I know I threw a lot at everybody. And um, this is new to so many people, but um, I can scroll back through slides or I'm happy to uh, take questions now. Thank you, Jason. Does anyone have questions for him on this presentation? I see one um, in the chat. Is it possible to get the slide deck of the presentation? It will yeah. be, it is being recorded. So you'd be able to see it that way, but I'm not sure, Jason, if that's something you'd be willing to share. I think that's just fine. And I pulled each one of these images directly from my report too. So I hope that we're, we, Jillian and I haven't talked, it was less than two weeks ago that we submitted our report, but I hope that we can disseminate that out to those people that are interested in it as well. I'll stop sharing there. Thank you. The slide deck would be a lot easier to follow than going back through the recording. Absolutely. Yeah. And you did throw a lot of good information and I'd like to go back and look at a few things a little more closely. So that'd be helpful. Thank you. So we do have some time. Does anyone have questions for Jason? There's a question in the chat from Bill Ryan <clears throat> asking how much of the data is used by the tool is available versus how much needs to be gathered for specific projects to be analyzed. All of the data that we're using within the tool is publicly available data. We didn't create any new data in there. Um, the only thing that we have organized into the tool are cost scenarios and locations of tide gates. The locations of tide gates are available to the public. Okay. I think we could add the slide deck to the partnership website. I don't see any reason not to do that. Uh, and then I'm not sure 
Bill, I'm not sure. Did that fully answer your question? Are you asking too? Is there any like project specific information that needs to be loaded into the tool? Yeah, and and really just sort of the level. I'm, I'm assuming there is. If you're going to be looking at multiple potential projects, I'm just curious how much of it involves having to actually physically go out to the site to get that information to utilize the tool, or how much of it can be done sort of as a desk exercise initially. Yeah, initially it is a desk exercise. It's a it's kind of a pre-planning, you know, project right. to you know start conversations and such. To set up the GIS platform within the tool, we do have to look at the landscape behind the tide gate and evaluate that area of tidal influence and that little say sub watershed or mini watershed that's coming down through the tide gate. But that's done, you know, using using GIS tools. Great, thank you. And I would say. Bill, um, really good question. And I think it's important what Jason just mentioned for everybody to hear that this is the pre-planning tool. So this is um, when we think at OWEB about um, a group working on a, on a set of projects in a watershed, this is that chance for them to go and look and say, okay, these are probably the 10 tide gates that we wanna focus on based on this analysis that we think um, we could go get funding for um, through a federal program, through a state program. So it is not intended to be the thing that says this project will be no more than a million dollars, period. Um, it's just giving that estimation so they can operate within their budget and everything would have to go then through design and, and um, engineering and all of that um, additional analysis. This just gets them in the door in a much more efficient way. I'd also add if you don't have a budget constraint or if you want to pretend like there isn't one, you don't have to put one in. You can just say, hey, if the world was my oyster and I had unlimited funding, what tide gates would it push me towards to answer whatever question is, whether it's, you know, again, private infrastructure protection versus agri, you know, versus uh, coho land improvements. But um, <clears throat> and also what it doesn't do is it doesn't tell you if those are willing landowners. So that's the other thing to be aware of is like it might say it might give you a list of 10 tide gates, but you still have to do the work to see if those are interested partners in um, doing a project with you. And so um, that's why it's a really helpful pre planning tool. It's also helpful as tide gates are replaced or improved, you can drop them out of the list and then it will, you know you can rerun the scenario and see where it might ask you to work next. Um, I see another question in the chat, does the tool take sea level rise into account? Yeah, the way that we're set up right now is we can run the tool for present day scenarios, um, current uh, inundation scenarios, current sea level, and we can run the tool looking out to 2100, about 80 years to predictions of sea level rise there. I did. Any other questions? Chat looks quiet. I will say this, you know, we also are available to answer any questions if you want to get offline. Like if Tammy, if you want to have a call with us and go through it and answer specific questions, we're here, we're available. We'd be happy to do that in addition to, you know, more formal routes of giving presentations. So um, yeah, just let us know. Okay. Excellent. Thanks to you both. We are going to, we are ahead of schedule, you guys. Nice job. Um, we are going to move ahead to our next item on the agenda, a presentation on the pipe sizing tool. And Mel, I'm going to hand it over to you to introduce the team. Great. Thanks, Jillian. And um, thanks to everyone who's uh, presented so far. Really uh, encouraging and exciting work that's been happening. Um, so I wanted to just do a really brief introduction before I hand it over to our partners uh, with Northwest Hydraulic Consultants who've really done the, the heavy lifting with the, the tool development. Um, and just remind folks of kind of where, where, this, where this all started. Uh, you know, again, back at those landowner listening sessions a number of years ago, one of the main points that was raised was concern and uh, about the complexity and expense of the design process. And so from that, um, OEB uh, funded this work to help streamline uh, and provide a, 
a solution for that, that uh, issue. Um, and so with that, we, we uh, compiled, compiled a team um, to develop a tool that would uh, give you uh, an estimated pipe size for um, your new tide gate. Um, the team comprised of uh, folks with NOAA and ODFW, as well as myself and Ed Hughes from the Coos Watershed Association. And then um, we hired on uh, Northwest Hydraulic Consultants to, uh, as engineers to uh, work on this process. And really the uh, goal of the work is to uh, I come up with a tool that is simple for, for folks to use and um, gives you a, an estimated pipe size and uh, also uh, having that size meet the current regulatory requirements. Um, and so uh, we're, we've made a lot of progress that NHG will get into. And uh, one, one thing I wanted to note is that this tool is not gonna be replacing the need to have an engineer, uh, nor is it gonna replace the need to still go through consultation to get permits. Um, but this tool is really going to help streamline um, that and provide cost savings um, in, um, when you go through this um, engineering phase of, of your project. Um, and so they're gonna uh, uh, hand it over to them and they'll, they'll kind of talk through um, what, what uh, the components of the tool are and where we're headed for next steps. And I'll just put a plug that this is kind of our overarching preview and then there'll be more uh, webinars on how to use the tool as well as a guidance document and also webinar, webinars and a, a kind of a methodology written up for folks on the more technical side of this who are interested in that piece as well. Um, and I know there'll probably be some questions at the end. And so we'll probably tag team uh, responding. Greg Apke and Ed are also on the uh, call here. So we'll, we'll you know, as, as needed, we'll, we'll probably all uh, jump in with, with answers to um, direct that, uh, any questions. All right, well, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Kevin and Vaughn with NHC. Yeah, we can hear your screen, but not uh, you. You all might be on mute if you're um, talking. Yep, there we go. How's that? Okay, great. We're a Microsoft Teams user, so Zoom is new to me. Um, thank you for that, Mel. Um, is there anyone that can't see my screen? You, Mel, you said that it's coming through okay. Looks looks good. Great. All right. Um, thank you for the introduction, Mel. Um, so what we'd like to do is uh, just take a few minutes and. Um, briefly go over uh, the approach uh, that we've taken from the start and the design of this tool, uh, share with you guys uh, the work that we've completed so far, um, and then briefly talk about uh, the next steps. Uh, so from the beginning, uh, just a little recap on the goals of this tool uh, is to support a uh, landowner by uh, streamlining the permitting process. Um, and by accomplishing that, um, we will uh, reduce the overall costs, particularly uh, the engineering costs. Um, in the design, we were charged with making the tool uh, as simple as possible, um, but it still needed to be accurate. So uh, there's, uh, uh, the, we needed to strike a balance between um, this uh, accuracy and simplicity um, because the tool needed to be trusted obviously by the agency reviewers. Uh, so in the balance that we struck um, between the two, um, we still anticipate um, the need, uh, the potential need for uh, some assistance using the tool uh, with the target audience. Um, and potentially that could be the local conservation districts. Um, and just to reiterate um, one of the uh, objectives with the, of the tool, um, it will not replace uh, the design engineering uh, aspect of that altogether. Um, so to briefly go over, um, at, from the beginning of this, there were three approaches that we looked at. Um, all of these are, are, are simple approaches, um, kind of going down the list here, they get even more simple. Um, again, trying to strike that balance uh, and make it as simple as possible. Um, the first being uh, a physics-based computer model um, that describes 
um, the tight gate water flow in the system. Um, the second being a statistical approach, um, which basically we looked at which of the factors um, in the tide gate system have the biggest impact. Are there any that um, have insignificant impact that we could potentially remove uh, to further simplify the tool? Um, what we found in that is um, all of the components um, have a significant impact on the results. And so we weren't able to eliminate any of those. Um, and the, the third approach, um, we tested some approaches um, that are already used in practice. And while this is the easiest, um, we weren't able to ensure uh, that they would work in all potential tide gate replacement projects. Um, so with that, we went with uh, the computer model or a simplified hydraulic model, um, it being the most accurate as well. Um, but because it is of these three, um, the, I guess, least simple, uh, the next challenge was to work on simplifying the required input from the users. So just a, a real high level conceptual overview um, of kind of the inner workings of the simplified hydraulic model. Here's a little illustration, um, starting with um, the culvert and tide gate at the bottom in black. Um, so the goal being to design um, or, or to, to size this pipe um, and to be able to uh, predict all of the components for a given site that go into that sizing. Um, you can kind of divide these up, uh, the first being the inflows that come into the system, primarily from the hillside drainage. Um, that's defined in the tool by this uh, watershed area, which is outlined in red. Um, as the water collects in the floodplain area here shaded, um, it, it'll collect in uh, the uh, channel and ditch uh, ag ditch network. Um, and when the tide gets closed, when the uh, river stage is high, um, that storage will accumulate. And so that storage area behind the tide gate is kind of the second component in the tool. Um, the third being uh, the river stage on the outside. Um, and so taking all of these components um, and modeling uh, the flow um, into and out of the, the system, um, the tool arrives at um, a size that can uh, meet all the fish passage criteria. So we don't want the water moving too fast or too shallow. And to go into a little bit more depth on those uh, components. So these are the same that I just mentioned, starting with the inflow. Uh, we have the floodplain um, channel and ditch storage, uh, the tides, and then the culvert. Um, the sub bullets in black are the actual inputs that the users will provide. So um, starting with that red uh, polygon area for representing the watershed area is one, um, some information uh, to represent um, the channel network. So length and width uh, for the tides, for the tide component, um, the user would just need to input um, a range. So a single value between the highest high, uh, the higher high and the lower low. Uh, tied on any uh, typical day. Uh, and then a few culvert properties, so material and length. And with these, the tool uh, will solve for invert elevation uh, and diameter and produce a, a pipe size that meets the fish passage criteria. So that's uh, an explanation of the inputs um, kind of behind the scenes. Uh, this is an example of uh, where we are with our draft beta tool. Um, this is an example of the input page. Uh, so uh, option at the top to provide a name um, and then all of the properties here kind of working in reverse order from that previous page. So we have some culvert properties at the top, um, the tide properties, uh, the channel and ditch network properties, um, and then the watershed properties will be supplied uh, by this GIS interface. Um, the user will just need to navigate to their site uh, delineate the watershed, the contributing watershed area, the floodplain area. And then when the tools run on the back end, all of the watershed properties, um, the area, the soil capacity inflow um, will all be retrieved and produced automatically for use in the, the computation. Um, so after all those inputs are uh, provided, uh, run simulation, and this is an example of the output uh, that the user will be directed to. At the top, uh, some of the pipe properties are summarized. 
uh, along with some of the results. Uh, so the size and invert elevation. Um, summary of the most, um, uh, some of the most um, important results, um, especially regarding fish, fish passage are provided here along with some of the state targets uh, for comparison. Um, at the bottom, uh, we'll provide some information for technical support contact so the user will know uh, what the next steps are, what to do uh, with, these, uh, with this information. And then somewhere on the page right now, we have the button here. Uh, there'll be an, um, a provision to uh, allow the user or the, uh, the permitting reviewer um, to go and look at the complete output from the tool. And we have just a, a screenshot of where that currently is in its, its current form. Uh, we have a lot more summary statistics. Um, we have complete uh, time series information in the form of plots and both uh, raw data as well that can be downloaded uh, for the full two week simulation that runs behind the scenes. Um, and again, all of this can be um, accessed. So just wrapping up um, the remaining tasks in this first phase, um, finishing out the beta tool that's uh, so far been used for testing purposes by the project team, um, finishing up the documentation on the alternatives and um, the development, uh, documenting the development of the model engine or, or the back end, um, and just pointing out that uh, so far uh, that user interface that we shared um, has just purely been used for testing and there are a lot more decisions that need to go um, into what will go into uh, on the final um, tool when it's rolled out. Um, so we'll, we'll solicit some more feedback um, so that we can be certain um, on what the most important components are uh, to include in the tool. And finally, just to touch on a few considerations for the next steps, um, we're continuing to explore ways to reduce the burden of the input data on users uh, while simultaneously improving uh, the consistency and the accuracy of the tool application. Um, and to that end, uh, one obvious way would be to uh, leverage, um, uh, for instance, the decision support tool that Jason was just talking about um, and coupling that with uh, existing river hydraulic models that could provide tide data. Um, and what this would allow us uh, to do would be, um, it would give us the opportunity to pre-process virtually all of the tide gates on the coast, uh, tide gates on the coast. Um, and so, like I said, that would increase, uh, ensure consistency in how the tool is applied, uh, but also uh, further reduce the burden um, on individuals that would otherwise be providing assistance uh, to the landowners and users. Um, and finally, some potential add-ons uh, that I'd like to call out. Uh, and this is an added benefit of the approach that we decided on, um, the physics-based model. Um, we can more easily add uh, additional functionality, and some of these would include uh, adding mitigator um, capabilities. Um, currently, we don't allow for that. Um, we could include uh, flood, flood capacity uh, analysis in addition to the fish passage analysis. Um, and then finally, we could allow for uh, multiple outlets in uh, interconnected systems that do have multiple tide gates in the same system. Uh, so with that, thank you uh, for the opportunity to present uh, what we've been working on and uh, we'll open up the floor for questions. Thank you, Kevin and Vaughn and Mel. Um, anyone, we can use the chat or does anyone have a question on the tool? Just say, as folks are thinking about questions that they might have, um, having both the decision support tool and this high gate pipe sizing tool, um, having those as kind of a dream a few years ago, I just want to say to both of you, um, the from my perspective, at least what you've put together really exceeds expectations and is pretty amazing. And um, for not just for projects that are coming to OWIB to be able to reduce that cost on the engineering side and um, uh, Jason from your end to be able to have folks really strategically plan and prioritize that's huge for the funder um, but it's also a pretty big deal I think for those who aren't going for funding to have that much of the engineering um, taken care of 
know that it's going to get successfully through the permitting process um, is pretty cool. And so I just, I just want to say thanks to, to both of the teams for um, putting together these things. Um, I, I do, I do see these as pretty concrete outcomes of this process over the last few years. So thanks. And it looks like there's, I talked just long enough that you got three questions to pop up in Zoom. It did. Um, so the first question here um, in the chat, how are rain in inputs calculated for the tool? Is there an internal weather map with documented and predicted rainfall maps? Yeah, so we're, uh, for those of you who are familiar with stream stats, which is the USGS uh, regression tool to predict stream flow, um, it's available for I think every state in the country. Anyway, there's um, we're basically uh, reproducing that. That's its own online tool, but we pulled all the data sets behind that and the equations. And so once uh, the user delineates their watershed, uh, we pull in the um, precipitation, soil capacity, watershed area, and I don't remember a few other, the parameters we need to estimate the, uh, the mean monthly flows that we're using in the simulation. Okay, um, next question. It appears that pipe sizing tool is still a beta application. When will it be issued as an approved tool? I can take a stab at that and then um, members of the team can, can jump in uh, if there's anything else to add. Um, it's a great question. And really where we're at right now is uh, working through all those considerations that Kevin had projected on his screen. And we're gonna be taking about the next month or so to have additional meetings and to chew on that to develop what our next phase is gonna look like. Um, one, one thing that I was thinking we could do would just be to send an email update to Jillian with a, a more concrete timeline, and then that can get out to the partnership listserv later this fall that will have a, a, a better uh, timeline. At this point, uh, a little early to say uh, right now uh, exactly when that will be approved, but we're all really eager to have it approved and to, to get it out there. Um, and so indefinitely, uh, I know it was mentioned, um, I'll put a plug in, if you're interested, um, you know, connect with Jillian or if you have my contact info, please please um, connect with us if you're interested in being uh, kind of a beta, beta tool tester and you wanna take a look because um, we, we will be um, looking to have some landowners provide feedback uh, on this beta draft. Does anyone have any anything else to add on that question? No, all right. Okay, thanks, Mel. Um, it looks like Stephen's question was answered by um, by your first response there. And then uh, Fred has a question: Will an engineer be able to use the tool in lieu of doing the specific site work, and will agencies accept the tool results? I can, I guess on the first part, Fred, um, I'm, that's certainly our hope. I mean, we've, if we were being, you know, paid to do this as a one-off and using HECRAS, basically the model, we've reproduced what we'd be doing with kind of a off-the-shelf model that only engineers know how to use in a, in a model that runs much faster. And I, I think it's much easier to have the inputs. And again, that simplicity versus accuracy question for Greg, and we've been talking with uh, Aaron Beavers at uh, NOAA Fisheries, um, while it's not going to be, you know, just accepted without question, I think we've got the, the accuracy and the detailed hydraulics in this that our hope is it goes a, a long, long way towards satisfying agency reviewers that we've got the hydraulics right and, and this size culvert at this invert elevation, this material is going to meet fish passage criteria. Yeah, Greg Atkey of DFW, I'll just chime in real quick. Um, stepping back a second, this tool was developed to be just that, a tool primarily to help the landowners better plan for costs for culverts and tie gates, to give them something that they, as they're developing um, a project on their property where they know they either need to place a new tag gate or repair an existing. This tool was primarily developed to give folks an idea of what size of a pipe 
culvert, box culvert, et cetera, I'm going to need. And then therefore to start to project out costs for purposes of seeking funds or funding on your own, if I may, from the um, owner operator perspective. I'm optimistic this tool will, as it evolves, um, just that evolve into a tool that the regulatory agencies, particularly uh, no fisheries, no DFW can use and can embrace. Um, presently as designed, it's not designed to replace the regulatory agencies, um, you know, role. It's not a rubber stamp. Um, there are gonna be, and there is an expectation that project owners are still going to have to hire engineers when appropriate to facilitate a, a design for their tight gate repair or replacement project. So short answer, presently this tool, while we're impressed with its outputs uh, and we're looking very much forward to um, getting some projects uh, run through the tool, that's gonna really inform the tool's precision and accuracy from a regulatory perspective. And I do hope and am optimistic that we can uh, progress towards this tool being used to really help complement the regulatory process. So that said, um, it's not going to actually replace the need to hire an engineer, but it is going to certainly promulgate um, cost savings along the way for the landowners. Okay, thanks, Greg. Uh, the next question in the chat, can users run the model in reverse by plugging in a given culvert length and tide gate size to get water flow and water level stats? Some users may want to deliberately oversize their pipe and tide gate. Uh, yeah, it can absolutely be run that way. In fact, that's actually how it's designed um, and to actually produce the uh, designed size, um, it just goes through some iterations of that process. Um, that they were asking about. So it absolutely can. Yeah, and the, and the final tool, we, we've talked about, you know, the need to maybe have a, a simple input screen for kind of land, land owner um, users, but also be able to kind of expose more of the back end for more expert users that want to play around right. with um, some more kind of advanced modeling, looking at different sizes, or what if, um, you know, we dug out some tidal channels behind and in increase the storage area behind, what does that do to the hydraulics of those types of questions? So I think that's all fairly easy to implement. Okay, any other questions? Okay. Thanks to all of our presenters. Um, we are well ahead of schedule, um, which is awesome. And I just have one uh, last announcement to make to you all. This is kind of um, late breaking news that I learned on Friday. Um, I was notified that the Tigate Partnership um, has been awarded a State Lands Board Partnership Award. For this year. Um, so that is a testament to all of the time and energy and, um, and great work that you have all done. I have heard from a couple people, and I, I guess I feel like too, um, all of this work in all these years, it kind of feels like now um, we're finally at the starting line of this work that needs to be done. Um, so I hope that the award um, will feel like some great recognition for, um, for where we've all, you know, how far we've come, but I hope it will also inspire us um, to keep up the work um, and, and to really stay invested in this in the next year. So kudos to all of you um, for your hard work in, um, in earning this award. Uh, the ceremony will be held virtually um, on August 12th at 10 a.m. Um, and I'll send out more details to the full partnership email list uh, when I have them of how folks can participate. So congratulations. Jillian, October 12th. Oh, what did I say? August. Oh, no. No, it's not August. It's October. Thank you for the correction. October 12th. And um, I'll, send out, I'll send out details uh, when I have them. Thanks, Jillian.
So anything else today, folks, before we close the meeting? Since we are running a little ahead of schedule, Fred um, had posted a question in the chat. Um, maybe Greg, you could provide just a real quick update about the RAC process. Absolutely can, Fred, and thanks for your question. Um, and for those that don't know, Mr. Measurely has just recently joined the state of Oregon's Fish Passes Task Force. So Fred, kudos to you for stepping up. Uh, this opens the door for Fred and all his wisdom and experience to really flow seamlessly into our state's public advisory board. This board, our task force, helps advise the Department of Fish and Wildlife on all things fish passage, including policy making, funding, et cetera. So Fred, welcome. Um, we have a upcoming fish passes task force meeting October 15th uh, in just a few weeks and that'll be Fred's very first meeting. Running parallel to that effort, the state ODFW for the last, well, it seems like forever, since about February has been in fact working slowly through a kind of stem to stern fish passes administrative rule uh, revision and update. And we're in the middle of that process. And I think that really speaks to Fred's question. We have de developed a subcommittee uh, which comprises of many stakeholders. Uh, we have bi-weekly meetings where we're looking at um, many, many public comments. We received, I think, in addition to 280 public comments on fish passes rural revisions for the department to consider. And guess what? Amongst that suite of public comments are, in fact, uh, a litany of comments surrounding tide gates. So we have yet to get to the design criteria section for tide gates, and we expect to in mid to late October. So for folks that are unaware of this, you can reach out to me. Our ODFW website has a dedicated page to our Fish Passes Rural Revision Initiative, and you can engage publicly in these meetings. Um, and we really encourage public participation. So um, Fred, Beyond that, that's a pretty good snapshot of what we're doing. This process, we hope, will roll up sometime late this year, if not early next year. And then the administrative rule um, revision summary will be presented to our Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission for their adoption. We're presuming sometime in the summer of 2022. So there you go. Thank you for the update, Greg. You're welcome. Anything else today before we close? Maida, you came off mute. I was just gonna say we um, thank you for all of the notes about um, what the focal area should be for the um, outreach meetings this fall. So that a lot of good feedback that was uh, placed in there um, that we'll take and, and make sure it gets um, uh, considered for the outreach meetings. Um, and then again, just a huge thank you to all of you. This um, it is a, now a long-standing partnership, probably longer standing than Craig um, Herman would wish that it was, but I do think um, there's some good things moving along and, and more work to come. So I'm very excited about the um, State Land Board Award and um, um, and watching from a distance um, to see the, the great work that you guys are going to do moving forward. Okay. Well, thanks all. We will be in touch with more details on outreach um, on the State Land Board Award um, and reach out to me anytime. Thanks and, and many thanks and uh, bon voyage to Meta. So. Okay, take care all. There's ever a tide gate on the Mount Hood, we'll have bigger conversations. <laughs> Try to avoid that. Yeah. <laughs>